when I see these place names, it connects me with the past. It's like you just open, you take away the veil and you just look at these people that were here these 30 generations ago. They were still just like us, they were people. They had their grief, their laughter, their tears, their destiny, whatever. But still they're just people. The past did happen, history is just what someone wrote down. And that's Vilborg David's daughter, and she's a distinguished and renowned Icelandic writer. She's the author of a series featuring a Viking woman leader from the Icelandic sagas called Uther the Deep-Minded. Now, Uther was a wife of Olaf the White, the Irish-born Viking king of Dublin. And Vilborg's also written a novel inspired by Melkorka, that intriguing Irish princess slave from the sagas who's been such an inspiration to us in this series. I'm Helen Shaw, and this is Mother's Blood, Sister's Songs, the story of how the genetics of Iceland reveals its female Gaelic roots. So in Reykjavik last September, composer Linda Buckley and I sat down with Vilberg in her beautiful home to talk to her about her open obsession with both the Scottish and Irish Gaelic connections to Iceland. And we talked about her experience of using the women from the sagas, like Uther and Melkorka, in her own fiction. Now, Vilborg speaks English with a distinct Scottish accent reflecting her time there. And she talks to us about how, in so many ways, she feels in her writing she is giving voice to the lives and the work of her ancestors, those mothers who birthed Iceland. My name is Vilborg Davisdóttir, Vilborg, daughter of David, and uh, I'm a writer, and I'm an ethnologist, and I'm a widow, and I'm a mother of three children, and a granny of two babies. Um, You say that you've been somewhat obsessed with this connection between Ireland and Iceland over the years, and our four mothers who come from Ireland and Scotland. And what sparked this interest? And this, of course, is connected to your first novel, Kurka, which I'd also love to ask you about. I can't honestly remember when that obsession really started, but I do remember when I was a child, I grew up in a small village in the Westford Peninsula in Iceland called Sink Ere. Sink is the uh, Icelandic word for an assembly or a gathering of the Norse where they came together to uh, enforce the laws and proclaim the laws and so on. And um, in the middle of that tiny village, which is just uh, like four or five hundred people living there, there are quite a few small hillocks or knolls. And these, according to the local lore, is the place where people would come gather for that assembly in the age of the settlement when the first people came there. And I remember thinking, that must have been wonderful. You know, thinking about what was it like for the people coming here in the ninth century? What was it like to be the very first one to see that land? What would have surprised them? What would they have thought about it? And who were they? And then I somehow I discovered that, yes, they were obviously they were from Scandinavia, mainly from Norway, but they had with them a lot of slaves. And we have stories or anecdotal information in the sagas and in the Book of Settlement about these people, that they came from Ireland and they came from Scotland. But we don't know much about them. And I was just, I really wanted to know more about them. So when I decided in my 20s that I would want to try to write a novel, I thought I'll go back to the very first times of Icelandic history. Because I had myself been reading lots of historical fiction in English about um, taking place in Wales or England, north of England, around 11, 12, 13 centuries. And I thought that was just very interesting to see the history from the inside, from the viewpoint of the people that lived it. I found that very interesting. So I started just to do as much research as I could. And this was in the early 1990s, obviously in days gone by, no, no internet. 
just this one national library I could go to and uh, ask for help. Find, can you find me books on the Viking Age and about slavery? There was nothing on slavery. But I did discover enough to do that, to write that story. And my main character of that first book is uh, called Korka. And she's the daughter of an Irish woman who's taken captive in Ireland and brought to Iceland in the age of settlement in the nice century. And the father is a chieftain, a Norwegian who does not acknowledge his child, but her grandmother does. So that's how that came about in short. Um, another very strong female character that appears in your writing is Oda the Deep Minded. Maybe could you tell us a little bit about her and why you were drawn to that as a kind of a strong female voice? It probably came about first because I um, flitted to Scotland in 2005 and I knew that in Laxdala Saga, the saga of the people of the Salmon River Dale, it says that this woman, either the deep-minded or odd the deep-minded, that she came from Caithness. She settled in Iceland, but her husband was Olaf the White, the first Viking king of Dublin, the greatest warrior king in the Western Oceans, no less. And I thought, being in Scotland... And knowing that story, I think that would be a very interesting, dramatic material for a novel. And I planned on writing a novel, one novel. In the annals, we get to know about two wives of Olaf. Uther is not one of them. So either you guys didn't know about her or something happened. And it was maybe such a short time that they were together that never got written down. Actually, the two wives that are mentioned in the Irish annals, they're not mentioned by name. That happens all the time. You have, you know about women, but no one bothers to remember the names. So I put together a story starting in the Hebridean house where she grew up with her family. And it's a large family and almost all of them went to Iceland. And um, her marriage on the Isle of Man, actually I put that in. But it could quite reasonably have happened there. And then she goes off to Dublin and uh, half of the book takes place there. And then in the next book, that Scotland, the Highlands, and also the island of Tyree in the Hebridean Isles, because that's where I put the family down. The sagas don't tell us where in the Hebridean Isles they were, but Tyree fitted in every way. It's um, close to Ireland, which makes it the perfect base for the pirates. You know, they, they live in, on Tyree, they go and raid in Ireland throughout the summer, and then they come back to Tyree for the winter, and so fertile soil and everything they needed. I'd love to know a little bit more about the connection of place names connected to the sagas from Iceland in Scotland and in Ireland. Um, you've just returned from Scotland where you really sort of focus on this. The place names are so fascinating because they are like a window into the past and north of Scotland and the Hebridean Isles, also in, on the Isle of Man, you have so many place names which is so easy for us Icelanders to translate back into our, our, our tongue. Sometimes the, um, how can you say this, the washing machine of time has kind of Shrunken them. Uh, for an example, in the saga of the Orkney Earls, we have a place called Skarabolstadir. It's a three part word. Skare, that means um, thin slate or um, either on snow or just stone. Bolstadir means a place where you live, a farmstead. Always when you have a place name ending with stir, that it comes from stadir, which is Icelandic or Norse, if you will, for a place to live in. Uh, farmstead. So Skarabolstar is today Scrapster. It's just shrunk to Scrapster, which is on the north coast of Scotland. To me, when I when I see these place names, it connects me with the past. It's like you just open, you take away the veil, and you just look at these people that were here these 30 generations ago. They were still just like us. They were people. They had their grief, their laughter, their tears, their destiny, whatever. But still, they're just people. The past did happen. History is just what someone wrote down. And I find that so important. I'd love to hear a little bit more about your background growing up in the West Fjord Peninsula and how that impacted on what you went on to do later. Do you think that growing up in such a remote place actually impacted on what you became interested in later? I think it has a lot to do with the fact that my parents love books. Or my my father, he bought books. It was like food to him. I remember once when I was a single mother and I was complaining about the pricing of books. And he said, uh, Wilbur, my dear, 
if you don't have money to buy the books you want to buy, you don't have any money for food, and then you must come to me because I can lend you. I can pay them for you. <laughs> so just great respect for authors, for writing stories. He would read to us. I'm the fifth of uh, six children. I have four older brothers. And he would read to us from uh, the, folk, the collection of folk tales. I read your manuscript. And what? yeah, and it was like, you know, when, when you talk about her having the red haired child, we were just talking about that in the kitchen, about this idea that the stereotype in Ireland is red hair. And I think we've less than 10 percent in, in the population of Ireland have red <laughs> hair. But you chose that as, as this moment in the story, which is what breaks her relationship with all of the white. So maybe talk about that, because like we're taken by how much red hair. And last night I was in the swimming pool. Mm -hmm. And there were these two little boys and like they were so Irish looking, but they're Icelandic speaking and um, they were like five and seven, bright red hair and freckles. For you, it's in that story. Can you tell us that about the, the other child that she has in Dublin in your in your story? Yeah, but the thing is, that whole idea stems from the fact that all the deep minded or other and all of the white, obviously with the fair hair, that's his by name is the white. They have a son who's called Thorstein the Red. So all the uh, different sires mention that he has red hair. You don't get a name like that unless you have red hair. And I know that he had six girls. He and his wife, third year, they had six girls. And then just the one son, who's called Oliver after his uh, grandfather. And his second name is Phelan, which means uh, in Irish, I'm told, a little wolf. And a few years ago, I was invited to stay in Dublin for some weeks because uh, the, I was invited by the uh, library, the city library, to stay uh, somewhere and um, work on my writing in Clontarf. It had to do with uh, the anniversary, thousand years anniversary of uh, the Battle of Clontarf. And I did do some lectures in the libraries of Dublin and they were bringing in 12, 13 years old to listen to me talk about the connection between Ireland and Iceland. And I was telling about these by names, the Celtic or Irish by names that we have in that family. And I still remember what I was told, telling him about this little Oliver Phelan who came with his grandmother to Iceland and was raised by her because his parents were dead. And up went this little hand and someone stood up, bright red hair with freckles and said, Miss, my name is Phelan. Oh, that was just fantastic. And he could have been Icelandic just as well. Tell me about your connection with Ireland. Well, um, I lived in Ireland in my head for years because of that first book. I was only, what was I, in my yeah, mid-twenties when I wrote it. And I always wanted to visit. I just still remember this. In 1996, the summer I, I was definitely I was going to visit Ireland. It turned out there were no flights to Dublin, but there were flights to Glasgow instead. So that's how my obsession with Scotland started because I decided, OK, I'll go to Scotland. It's the next best thing. So I went with my partner and we drove around all around Scotland and I thought I'll be back here again, which I did. Well, it took me 10 years to get back there. But anyway, so I was always on my way, but I didn't go until 2012, all these years later. And I went for a couple of weeks with my late husband. I have a friend who is um, an Icelandic uh, priest who uh, was uh, a priest in Kells at the time. So we swapped places. She lived here in Iceland and I and we had her house in Kells. And she had a friend who was a guide and she took us to see um, mounds. You know, obviously we did go to Tara and we went to um, New Cranes and all that, touristy places with lots of queues and all that. But it was even more magical to visit these mounds in the Boyne close to Kells, which we could see there. So that, that was my first time visiting Ireland. But then uh, I was invited to um, come and stay in Dublin for six weeks in 2014. And I met the city librarian in 2012 to arrange for that. And then when that date came, I was a widow and my husband had passed away in 2013. But he had said to me already, you will go whatever happens. So I took our nine year old girl with us and she went to school in Dublin. But it was a, just a fascinating experience for her as well, being there, going to school with the Irish children and practicing her English. So it's like I always feel in Ireland we're sitting on all these words that we have kind of forgotten the connection, as you were saying, yeah, yeah. to the history, like because yeah. everybody knows Wexford and Waterford 
Viking. But the, it's the SK words and the sounds that, you know, that we have the skerries and the several skerries mm -hmm. that, you know, the, the Vikings are, are in our bones as well as here. People can tell me about the genetic connections or I can read the sagas. But actually, when last year when I came and I was sitting in, in those open baths and I'm looking at the old ladies and I was saying, they look exactly like my aunts. You know, they looked like old ladies I know, these Icelandic ladies. Mm. But what was your experience? How did you feel in Ireland? Did you feel there was a physical connection with you? Absolutely. I, I, I felt, you know, just looking at people both in Ireland and also in Scotland, especially in the north of Scotland and in Orkney, even more so is that you can see this could be people from my hometown because we look very much the same. And maybe the outlook, how you see life is maybe something similar as well. I discovered when I was in Dublin that I found that the Irish were not so um, not so much aware of that connection with the Vikings. But someone explained it to me nicely in saying that, well, in Iceland, you never had any invasion at all. You just, the people came here, never had war in this land. We never had anyone invading us. But in Ireland, you have such a wealth of history with all the invasions that you have in your mythology tales about, you know, the people of the goddess of Danu and the Form Formorians and all that. And then you have the age of the saints and then you have the... Uh, Viking invasions, then you have the Norman invasion, then you have the English and then you have some more troubles and troubles and when you, when you talk to Icelanders about the saga time or you know the age of the settlement, which is 1200 years ago, that's 30 generations, people talk about the uh, characters of the sagas like it could have happened last year even and they talk about the people mentioned in the sagas like they know them personally which is very different. There is something because of that different history of our countries that people may have a different view of the past, I think. But you said something earlier, which is interesting to us about when you went researching in the library, when you started and you were saying, give me books on the Viking Age and the settlement and give me books on the slaves. And there weren't many. What's your sense about that? Because slaves are peppered around the sagas. She gets a name, Melkorka, but the, there is slave stories around mm. the sagas. What's your sense about the story of the slaves and how that connects with the Icelandic settlement story. What I have found from the very beginning of doing research on that subject is that people are embarrassed. It's embarrassing that those blonde, fair heroes with the blue eyes who are, you know, fighting each other with these huge weapons who had names, the, the weapons and names, that they actually had slaves. And our word for a slave is threat, and that's where we get the word thralls. And some claim possibly that's correct, is that the status was not the same as when you think of a slave in the plantations of uh, America 200 years ago. But uh, we don't know because when they're mentioned in the sagas, it's quite often because they're doing something stupid and they have degrading names. They have names like Blacky, Kohler, you know, very dark looking or um, yeah, some names that are kind of degrading. Have you heard about the slave rising on the south coast of Iceland, where we have um, best men, people from the west, which may be Ireland, maybe uh, the story goes that this man goes raiding in Ireland and he brings lots of slaves or thralls with him to Iceland to settle and they rise against them. And it says that he took 10 slaves and we have five names in the book of settlements of these people and they're all male names. And I thought the other five were probably women who bothers with names of women anyway. So that's what I did in my third book about art the deep minded. I put that slaverizing in there. But the masters was, will always give the names. Obviously, it would not be Irish names because it's more easy to pronounce something like, you know, the, the slaves in America, they would be called John and Paul and so on. But we have Haltor, Skjaldbjörn, Gerröður. These are very, yeah, very good Norse names. But then we have one who is called Dravdretur. That means someone who is doing very dirty jobs, mucking up the uh, shit from the cows and so on. So I gave him quite a royal name. That was his own. So we get stories like that about the thralls. And sometimes they are given land for doing something good. Like there were two thralls who walked the whole length of the south coast of Iceland, almost all the way to Reykjavik, to discover Ingolf Arnason, uh, the first settler here in Reykjavik, discover his uh, poles. It was these huge poles that people would have for the seat carved with pictures of the gods. They would put them overboard when they were coming close to the shore 
and the gods would decide where they would land and there you settle. So they had to seek for the poles, where does it come ashore? And they found it in Reykjavik. And um, one of them, he kind of used the opportunity to go, he, he escaped, but he was found. And the saga of the Book of Settlement doesn't tell us what happened when Ingolri found him, but just said he was found, probably killed. But the other one was given freedom. And now and again, we have people giving freedom to the thralls and they go and live here or there and you get the place name. But with either the deep minded, it's very different. So it takes with her 20 people sailing from Kithnes. And actually, there are two sources. One of them says that these were free men. But then it goes on to say, and she gave that slave freedom and he had this land and that slave got freedom. And he got that land. So we know about them, but people haven't really liked talking about it because it doesn't fit with that, you know, the image of the hero. But I think gradually people are realizing that the story must have been quite different when you have that, all that genetic research and 65% of the first generation of women come from the British Isles, Ireland, Scotland, the North and Western Isles of Scotland. So it fits perfectly with the idea that these are young men going out on the Viking ships, doing their raiding, and they uh, capture women. They take women from themselves. Sometimes the sagas are about people have settled in the British Isles and the second generation comes to Iceland. So we get the genetic, the DNA from there. But most often it must have been like that, that these are young men who are taking wives or taking women with them to Iceland. And so that fits, everything fits together when you look at it from every angle. So I kind of put emphasis on that. In my books, I want to lift up the work of women, the history of women. I mean, what happens in war is that the men are killed and the women are raped and the children are taken into captivity. And I think that's what happened. And that's the writer, Vilborg David's daughter. Now I've put some links to where you can find Vilborg's work in the text box of the podcast. And you can find out more about this series and our journey in Iceland on the website mothersbloodsisterssongs.com. We've added a lot of additional resources, video and stories. And if you do like this series, please do review it in your podcast platform and share with your own community in social media. Thanks so much for listening.